What is going on, people? We are Tottenham TV here, back again with another Tottenham update. Before we get into all the news, please do check us out on all podcasting platforms, uh, Spotify, Apple Podcasts. We are now on all audio platforms. And as well, our website, wearetottenhamtv.com for all the articles and written content. And as well, if you want to buy a T-shirt, help support the channel, would be greatly appreciated as well. And get yourself one of these. Look at that. Brian Daigle knows what it's about getting the merch. As you've noticed, as I've started, Ben is not in the studio today. He is away uh, up north. So we have the great Brian Daigle filling in, going through all the Tottenham news. Brian, lovely to see you back on the channel, my friend. It's always a pleasure to be with you, Ben, on the channel. It's been a little while since we've done one of these. And uh, thank you for asking me. My pleasure, of course. There's only one person to ask if there's <laughs> anyone unavailable, and that is of always Brian Daigle. Let's get in to the Tottenham news then, and starting with an update from Paul O'Keefe about Everton's Amadou Inanna, and he says that Tottenham like Everton's Amadou Inanna and might be looking at a deal for him in the summer. Um, apparently, uh, uh, I think I read a report, prices could range for him for around 70 to 80 million. Obviously, Everton in big financial trouble at the moment, of Obviously, they had their two now uh, second points deduction already this season, uh, precariously near the relegation zone. Could mean Amadou Inanna is available for less than that, potentially. Tottenham, um, in recent weeks, have had a bit of trouble in the number six position. Basuma's performances have dropped off. Hoybier doesn't seem to be fully trusted from the start. Ben Tancor seems to be still finding his feet after that injury. Um, and Amadou Inanna is having a really good season at Everton. What would you make of him? Are you a big fan of his? Uh, let's put it this way, Simeon. I, I've been saying, I even said on the fan show on Sunday, what we need is an elite number six. This is the position we definitely need to identify uh, to, to stop the defence looking so open. And I looked across, I, I, I rate him as a player. I highly rate him as a player. My preferred pick is Paulinho. Um, I've been looking at social media, as, as we all do, and there's two, there's two ways of looking at this. One, that he's a great player and he could do be the, the 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 right guy for the job young and ready to to fight and then there's the other side where like you said last week when it came to looking at leicester and you said maybe the jaws music is being played um, <laughs> and I was myself at that i told ben um it's looking at it is the jaws music going and it's financial <laughs> difficulties and we're circling either way i think he is a very very good player i think he's a very very good player um I said I think we need elite. Do I call him elite? Not yet, but that's him playing in an Everton team. With a bigger team, he could be that player, but it's certainly the kind of direction I want to see us going for, like players in this position. Um yeah, and I think for me, I like Amadou Nana. I think obviously this is his second season now at Everton, I believe, and he's um, really taken to the Premier League very, very well. And obviously he's been in poor Everton teams, as you say. Yeah. I just think what what about the number six position for us needs upgrading? Is it, do we need someone who's better on the ball than a Basuma or a Bentacle? Do we need someone who's better off the ball than a Basuma or Bentacle? Is it a bit of both uh, um, that, that we're struggling with? I look at Onana and I think he's a, he's a monstrous number six uh, or or, yep. uh, sorry, not even number six. He's more of a... He usually plays in kind of double pivot for, for Everton, I should say. Uh, but he's absolutely monstrous off the ball. He covers so much ground. I think he's always near the top for like the tackle numbers, interception yep. numbers. But then I look at... If I compare him to Basuma... Um, the, in terms of tackles, interceptions actually perform pretty similarly uh, in, in that respect. Um, so is he a massive upgrade on Basuma defensively? I'm, I'm not 100% sure. What I would say is maybe what some of Basuma's um, uh, pitfalls defensively, especially recently, maybe wouldn't be picked up on the stats because it's been lost as a concentration, letting runners yeah. appear late in the box, not tracking his runners. And you're never going to find a stat like how many times someone lost their runner, are you, um, uh, in, in the stats. So maybe Maybe those kind of things Onada could improve. The big question is, is he a big improvement on Basuma on the ball? Um, I think there's not much evidence of that just yet. Although I would say recently, if you take Basuma's recent form, you can maybe argue argue yes. But obviously Basuma um, playing at his best, I don't know yet if there's any evidence of him being better than Basuma on the ball. But again, you have to caveat that. He's playing an Everton team who a lot of the time don't have that much possession, yeah. playing on the counter-attack. Obviously, he's not going to be, he's not playing in a possession-based system where he's got options all the time like Basuma does. So maybe you put him in a possession-based system, he's going to look a lot um, better on the ball than he does now. So for me, if you're spending that kind of, you're spending, if you're potentially spending 17 million on him, 
I'm not 100% convinced he's an upgrade. Not to say I don't think he's a good player. I do think he's a very good player. And I do yep. think he would he would benefit the squad greatly. I'm just not convinced he's an upgrade on what we have at the moment. Not to say he not, not necessarily isn't. Obviously, he's younger. He's a bit, maybe maybe potentially has a higher ceiling than Basuma. But right now, is he an upgrade on Basuma? I don't know. I'm not. I'm not convinced by that at the moment. As much as I think he's a good player, so that's kind of where I stand on it. I kind of feel like if we're in number six. What we what we are looking for is someone who we know has a ability uh, uh, like to dictate, dictate a game on the ball with their passing ability, and I don't know if he does that. Uh, specifically so I don't know I'm not convinced we should spend 70 million on him is I guess what I'm saying but I'm not I, I do think he would benefit the squad if we were to sign him the, the way I've been looking at this Tim, is you look at it I, I I look at the players we've got now now if we play Benson core in the six I kind of liken him to a Michael Carrick he's like the quarterback silky gets the ball distribute what we need is a rock hard hard as now it's like a Patrick Vieira like an N'Golo Kante that literally is there to mop up everything in uh, that defensive shield, that defensive cover. And you look at it with um, a doggy and Porro going forward and being out of position a lot of time because that's what Angie's asking. When we lose possession, our defence is easily exposed. Just look at the first goal with Forrest. And it's happened time and time again. We need that kind of Paulinha. And you look at it for the tackles he's won and getting the ball that's what we need. We need that cover to say, right, you're not, you want to get to our defence? You're going to have to get through me first. Like a Wanyama did for that year, like an, uh, a Dembele did. I think we've got all the other six, like I said, a Basuma, ball carrying, Benson core, distribution, but we haven't got that hard as now as you've got to get past me to get to them. And that's where I think we're missing. And does Anana bring that? I, I don't know. I think he does bring that, to be fair. I think if you're looking for a potential upgrade defensively, I think maybe Onana's your guy. I just I wonder what Ange is thinking about. Is he thinking we're losing too many of these transitions because you know, we're, we're not doing proper things on the ball or are we losing too many transitions because off the ball we're not doing the right things? I guess that's for Ange to figure out. Um, look, but let, let's move on. We're going to be talking about Brian Hill now and Feyenoord, according to 1908, have approached Tottenham for Brian Hill again. There is already concrete proposal from Brian Hill on the table. However, however, it is unknown whether it is a loan deal or a permanent. This comes from 1908, who are a Feyenoord publication now in Holland. However, Fabrizio Romano has chimed in on the Brian Hill uh, potential transfer. And he says, Brian Hill, he, di he uh, doesn't have any intention to leave Tottenham on a straight loan. Uh, he didn't in January, despite seven, several proposals. The plan for the summer remains the same. Focus on Spurs, or it has to be an important project with a permanent move. He is not keen on a loan move so far. Um, it's a pretty odd, I would say, uh, stance to take from Brian Hill, considering he's stagnating at Tottenham. He's not getting any kind of minute at all. I kind of half understood his January stance because he didn't want to another loan move where he's going off somewhere and coming back. He wants to find a permanent home or he'd rather remain at Tottenham and play and try and fight his way into a system where he knows if he can break into the team, maybe it's a system that suits him. But unfortunately, it doesn't seem to be trusted by Ange. But come January, uh, come the summer, surely you'd think he'd, he'd need to find a permanent home and if he was to remain beyond the summer um that i really have big worries about the future of his career yeah i mean listen let's have a look at this this transfer has not worked and it's not just brian hill's fault we've loaned him out all the time but when he has had opportunities he hasn't really grasped them and sometimes when he has got them he's picked up an injury and it knocks out but it's got to the point now where i think we can all say whether we like him or not he's surplus to requirements his time at Tottenham is done. He's not going to fit in. Um, there's no way he's going to get regular first-team football. This has to be a transfer done and out. I, I, we, we've said many a time as Spurs fans, we have so many players out on loan and can't get them off the books. And this is a big problem when it comes to squad depth and everything. Um, by hook or by crook, we've just got to get him out. Whether it means selling him and, and losing big on the, the original transfer fee, for me, it's just got to get done. I understand what you're saying. Come getting a season long loan is a lot different to going at January. But for me, this has got to be a sell. Immediately get out the door, give the money to Ange to help with whatever we have got in the summer from the club and they've given us. The players that we can get out to add money to the list to, to bring players in Ange once is vital this summer. Um 
for me, this has to be out the door for any amount of money possible. Yeah, I agree. And there's even talks that as little as six million could be enough to prize uh, Brian Hill away from door convince Tottenham to accept an offer, which obviously is a massive loss com considering we paid, I think, 22 million plus Eric Lamella for him. So a um, bit of a disaster it has turned out. But to be fair, yeah. if I'm Brian Hill, I would argue, have I ever had a run of games in, in a Spurs show? Have I ever given been given a proper opportunity to show what I'm capable of? I think there's an argument to say he hasn't. But I think if you're one of if you're Spurs or one of the Spurs, as managers I think you would you'd probably argue well whenever you have been given any chances have you ever given the Spurs managers any reason to persist with you have you ever given them a reason to give you a run of games and there's a fair argument to say not really either so I think there's both ways you could look at it but I think what we can all agree on is there's no good him staying at Tottenham right now because his career is just stagnating badly and I think he needs a move just for his own sake obviously I do think there's quality there but whether he's a player who's ever going to truly succeed in the Premier League um, I don't know I, I, I don't think so to be honest considering his attributes I don't know if he's suited to Premier League football so at the moment he has to be a, he has to be sold so um, yeah, just, to add on that, Sim, yeah. just to add on to that Sim, just what you were saying if you look at it and this is where I do have sympathy for Brian Hill he's come to Tottenham under Nuno and he, what's he had Nuno Conte Stellini Mason and now, Ange, he's had five managers in the, the brief time he's been here. Not saying that's there's well, a lot was of he here, Was he here when Stellini and Mason took over? I think he might have been out on loan. He might have been on loan, yes. So, so either way, he's been here where we've gone through, whether he's been on loan or not, a, a, a long string of managers. I don't know a lot of players that can say they've been here for a brief, unless you're a Watford player, and, and, and gone through so many managers. So, so there are players at Tottenham that unfortunately have had to go through this, so adapting to a system or or fitting into that manager's kind of way of playing football. Um, if Nuno had been here and if Nuno had been a success, would he have worked? We never know, but thank, it didn't work out, so it's one of those. But yeah, it, it's not going to work at Tottenham, is it? It really isn't. Um, but and in terms of following from what I said before as well, the only time he probably did have an actual run of games where he looked like he could actually fit into this team was under Conte back in January, where he you know he started a few games in a row, was actually starting to get some assists and actually starting to get some contributions, and then uh, out of nowhere we loan him out again. And instead of actually keeping him around and using him, we decide to loan him out. So um, I think from that point of view, like that was probably the only time like Brian Hill might have actually yeah. made a difference. But yeah, I agree. I think we have to move on. And we're Pushing also going to move. Go on, go on. Go on quick. If no. we'd actually loaned him out to a British team, whether mm. it had been a pre another Premier League team or a, champ a high up championship team, maybe that could have been the spark that would have given him the regular game time that he needed, especially with the physicality. But again, he went out to Spain all the time. So, so we'll never know, will we? Yeah, if he would have gone to a Prem team and actually had regular game time and showed what he could do regularly in the Premier League, there would be more justification for, I guess, giving him opportunities, wouldn't it, in the Premier League for Spurs? Yeah. But that never happened. He kind of went back to La Liga where we know he's capable of performing well there and it didn't really prove anything at the end of the day. So, uh, And also, it didn't really help develop him, I felt, those moves because um, he just wasn't regularly playing all the time. The Valencia one, he wasn't regularly in the team. The Sevilla one, he was a pretty successful loan spell to be fair but um, it didn't really prove he could do it in the Premier League I guess is, is the thing and he, he, yeah. he didn't come back a new player with new confidence he just seemed to be the same player um, so it's unfortunate for him and is what it is I think we probably need to get rid um, next up we're going to be talking about Jed Spence and Marco Ottolini the Genoa sporting director has been talking about the possibility of Jed Spence moving permanently um, to Genoa he says I speak with Jed every week we have created a good environment for him we are trying to make him feel warm and welcome here and this will then translate into his performances on the pitch we want to give him the right conditions to perform we still have seven games to go we want to see what we can, what he can do personally I like Jed and how he's doing and how is training of course he can do more and he knows this but we are in contact with Spurs and we evaluate a deal over the next few months giving us time to understand our both um, our both position and Jed's perspective on him potentially staying here um, sounds like uh you know, they like him. Uh, from what I understand from his loan spell uh, at Genoa, it's going fairly well, albeit he started off playing a lot of games and he lost his place in the team and now recently he's found it back again. Um, 
Is he one for you where you've got half an hour on him coming back into the first team next year if the loan goes well? Or is it if the loan goes well, hopefully that means we can get a buyer for him? Um, I, 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 so I, I heard something um, during the loan to Genoa um, that apparently he never wanted to go. And then there was a massive, massive, massive bust up with Ange. And he was like, well, if you don't go, you're not training with the under 23, stay at home, blah, 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 blah. Um, and obviously, you end up at Genoa. Um, when we signed him, I thought, you know what, this could be a good signing. Um, but obviously, he's never been given the opportunity. And if we are going to be in the Champions League next season, I personally feel we need better backup for Poro than, than Jed Spence. I, I, I wish this would have worked. I just don't see it working. Um, we saw in Nott's Forest what he's capable of. But then again, we've seen what Neil Warnock said about him attitude-wise. Um, I hope it works out for him at Genoa and he gets the move he wants. I think maybe that move out of the country may be benefit and do the world for him. Um, yeah, I just don't see this uh, coming off. If I see him coming back, I see him go straight back out in all honesty, whether it be a loan or a sale. I just don't see him fitting into the AND system at all. I agree. I, I'm not sure even if he is playing well where he fits in. Um, if, can he play that inverted fullback role? I don't know. I haven't seen any evidence of that, albeit you could say the same for Porro, and he's really adapted to it very well, so you can never say never. Um, I don't think he can be a right winger really in this in this system. I don't know if he's good enough to be a right winger in this system. So I do think it would be a view of more selling him. I think... <laughs> The fact that he's um, had a few different managers here at Spurs who haven't quite trusted him or given him opportunities says a lot to me. So I think probably it's a view to selling him. But uh, obviously you saw what happened at Leeds as well. He, he came in and it was a um, really bad uh, spell for him, wasn't it? Um, so it wasn't... Um, they, they, they complained about his lack of effort in training and all these different things. And when you're going out on loan looking to impress and that's the kind of attitude you have, that's really disappointing. So I don't, I, I don't know if it's worth giving him another go. It depends. If, if it goes extremely well in the last seven games, I guess we'll have to consider it and maybe give him another pre-season. But I think at the moment, I'm definitely leaning towards whatever money you can get, just, just get him out because it's not worth um, having that kind of mentality uh, around the squad. Um, all right, next one we're going to be talking about is Rudy Galletti talking about our striker search. And he says, Tottenham are looking to sign a new striker to strengthen the attack. He says, Santiago Jimenez appears to be the priority with contacts with Feyenoord going on for weeks. Good Monson is strongly followed by Inter and remains a concrete option in case no agreement with, uh, the, with the Italian club. So looks like Spurs are... Um, well, Rudy Galletti claims that Tottenham are definitely looking at a striker in the summer. Most other sources are claiming Tottenham are looking for a winger. Um, for you, uh, when it comes to that striker position, is that a priority for you in the summer? And if it is, are one of these two options one of the options you'd go forward with? Uh, right. First of all, like I said, I won't move from it. Number six is, is the absolute be all and end all for me and a very, very high standard one. I think we do need to look at that front line. That front line hasn't been firing on all cylinders. Like, let's say, the Conte first season when it was Kulu, Sun and Kane that were just non-stop and producing goals and assists non-stop and, and hard to contain. We definitely need a focal point because Sonny has had a few games where he's a little bit quiet as a, as a nine and people say, go to the left. And you have had Richarlison who has had that purple patch but he's getting injured too much. Is he another um, exit out the door this summer? We're yet to find out. So we do need a goal scorer and a proven one at that. Um, Jimenez, I'm not too sure about. Obviously, he's do doing very, very well in, in Holland. But we know sometimes with Holland, especially strikers, they've been very, very hit and miss in the Premier League. Do we want to go down that road? Is that something to be wary of? Um it's definitely something that needs to be addressed. And when it comes to Gumunson, uh, I'm not going to lie or, or try and sugarcoat everything. Listen, all I, I didn't even know about him until we were, were linked with him. And then obviously the links have come up and he's scored a couple of great goals for Iceland and he's now been spoken about a lot. 
But the way I've been reading things, and like I said, I don't know a lot about him. I see him more as the number ten, like a Teddy, Sh- a creative midfielder, more than a than a striker. I don't know if that's me being wrong. So I don't know those two names. Being one is an out and out striker, and what from what I understand, the other isn't. So uh, a bit bit confusing with the uh, with uh, the Goodmanson being used as a striker link. Yeah, I feel like Goodmanson he he can play a bit like that false nine position potentially. Um, he's having a real breakout season at the moment for for Genoa out in Italy and having a really great season. It's not like he's been performing consistently at this level for many years in Serie A, but you, I think at the moment he's having a great year and he's a very versatile attacker, so maybe he could cover a few positions in that attack as well. So maybe that's why we're seriously interested in him. When it comes to Jimenez, uh, I think we're on record on this channel that we're big fans of Jimenez. He's a really physical presence. He's actually good at built, um, at the bringing other players into play as well when he's really banging the goals for fun this season out in Holland. So he'd be a very much of interest. Whether we get priced out of that move, um, I'm not sure. In terms of the number nine position, I would ra- would I like would I rather sign one stri- one number nine and, and one winger, or would I rather sign two wingers? And I actually would rather sign two wingers if it feels hard I'd give the option. Because I think if we sign two wingers to really help the system, I think it would help the number nine, who, whether that be Richarlison or Son, um, be more, even more clinical than they are. I actually think Son and Richarlison are potentially both as a, a good enough to, for what we need. Son is one of the best finishers in, in the world. Um, and all you need to do is give him the chances and he gets the goals and sometimes he gets restricted of those chances but all you need to do is get him those chances and that's a goal Richarlison has proven this year obviously with a good spell that he can do that job as a number nine when fully fit obviously he's had his injury problems and he's got them again at the moment Um, and the fact that if he doesn't you know, hit some form between now and the end of the season, then you're talking about a 10-game spell in a two-year period. So on that front, is is that questionable? I think it's fair to say it is questionable whether you can say he's good enough based on 10 games in two years. But obviously, if you take into account he's Prem proven over years at Everton, the fact that he did start scoring goals at some point shows he can adapt to this Ange system. Um, and obviously, he's a regular for his national team as well. I would uh, I would side with, unless we have a big offer coming from Saudi and he wants to leave, I'm pretty happy with having them two as our strikers, in my opinion. And I don't see the massive need to bring in number nine if it means not bringing in two wingers, in my opinion. So... Um, Yes, Santiago Jimenez would be a really good replacement for Richarlison if we were to sell him. I, would, I wouldn't be against it. But um, if, if Richarlison was to stay, I, don't, I think that would, that would be okay. I think the, if we upgraded the winger positions, that would be of more benefit to the team than in the number nine, in my opinion. What, what do you reckon about that? Uh, listen, I, I, I think we definitely need to upgrade in our wingers. I, I, I want to go back to the days like when we had a Chrissy Waddle. That got to the byline and whip balls in. We we and literally hits target all the time. Chris, what we, we need some players that will take on the man. Um, I want out and out wingers like back in the old days. Not these guys that cut in and take a shot and take it away from the strikers. I want good old fashioned wingers. Even an Eze, I'd love to sit, listen. I, I wanted Eze more than Madison last summer. Um, and I he, he him and Paulinho are basically my top two on my shopping list for the summer. Um, if we could get two wingers of a very, very high standard, I would sacrifice that for a striker. Because if you can get two wingers in that can literally put balls on a plate, then you should, if you have a striker of any quality, be able to put them away. So I, I'm inclined to agree with you, Simeon, that if we can get two very high standard wingers or very good standard wingers over one striker, um, I would definitely be on your side of the fence. Hmm. I, I absolutely right. Um, and next up, last story we're going to be talking about is Basuma, and he was on Spurs play um, doing a car interview with Ben Haynes, and some interesting quotes uh, from him about how his season speed and, um, and and things like that. So let's talk of, uh, about his quotes. He said, um, "This season I started really good. Then after we were uh, um, after we were restricted because of a lot of injuries and suspensions, things like that, they put us in a difficult position. Sometimes I make mistakes." because I'm not perfect and I'm still learning so I know there's more to come but I'm happy enjoying the role in the team and I have to enjoy 
enjoy this moment and make the most of it as it um, as it's where I'm in fully in control, where I feel strong, feel like myself, I feel free, so I'm enjoying my moment. But in the end, I don't want I don't want to have any regrets, so I always have to fight to feel good. He also said I take full responsibility when it's time to change change things. Like when I was injured at the end of last season, I was already preparing for the new one. For me personally, when Ange came in, he told me exactly what he wants from me and in the role, and I'm just listening, working hard to perform in the way he wants me, and I'm really happy to work with him and the group. Then finally, he says, we're going to work really hard to put the team where we want to be because this team deserves a lot. I believe we can achieve great things because we have so many young players with so much talent. That's why I'm not worried about the club's future because I know what we will one day be where we are aiming to be. This club means everything to be. To be a Spurs pl player is such a big deal. It's a blessing for me to be here and I'm enjoying my moment here. I'm not only doing this for me, but for the club, for the fans, for my family and for everyone. I love everyone here and I feel love from everyone here as well. So that's the most important thing in life and football. I want only what's best for the club. So some nice quotes there uh, for Yves Basuma. Obviously, um, it's been a bit of a weird season for him, hasn't it? Because he yeah. started like a house on fire. We thought, you know, this is the real Basuma. He was the next, he, this is the next big thing. Then obviously he's had a couple of red cards and a bit of a downturn in form. Uh, you know, maybe a loss of confidence or, uh, or or something. Then he went off to the Afcon. He protracted malaria, and um, that was a difficult period for him as well. Um, I do feel like since the end of February time um, apart from maybe the Fulham game there has been a bit of an upturn in performances recently obviously he did go for half time against Forest as well so you could put that down to a bad performance but I do think in general the likes of Luton the likes of West Ham um, those kind of games he's been much better so maybe we're seeing his performance is starting to improve again but um th yeah I, I, it's been a bit frustrating one from Spurs fans point of view isn't it because when we signed him, obviously we were big fans of him at Brighton and yep. everyone thought, what, what a signing. And everyone was bigging up the signing. Then he had a bit of a disastrous first year. And then those first 10 games happened. You think, OK, this is the real Basuma. You know, finally we're getting, we're getting the Basuma that we bought. And then it kind of hasn't panned out like that. But what do you think in terms of recently? Do you feel like his performances are starting to get back to his best? Or are you still a bit frustrated that, you know, that it's been very inconsistent from him? So, so obviously, the the first ten games of the season, he was magnificent. the The whole midfield, actually, everyone was magnificent. Then, obviously, after Luton, he kind of f fell off a cliff, like literally fell off a cliff with his form. Yes, he's had injuries. Yes, the suspensions. Yes, the Afcons and malaria. But what I've seen with him is every single time he starts having a couple of good games, he then has a really pot. So it's just getting that consistency back. Um, what I will say in regards to the comments. Loved the accountability. Absolutely loved him taking full on and, and coming out and saying that. It, it's great to hear that. But the last part of it where he goes, yup, I'm not worried about the future. We're going places. We're doing this. We're doing that. It's different player. Same same spiel we hear after a loss. We must learn from this. We grow. We get bigger. We grow strong. Blah, blah. Actions speak louder than words. Um and uh, hearing players come out and say this, saying, yep, I'm not worried, we're going to do things, we're going places, I, I'm, I'm tired of hearing it and it not materialising. But in Basuma, I remember I was in the studio with you when, when, when we signed him and the, the deal came out. It was We were all absolutely delighted because we know, like the first 10 games of the season, he is a magnificent player and unplayable on his day. And I think, I, 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 I think what I need to do, I'm going to start a new petition those first 10 games, he was wearing that long elbow sleeve, wasn't he? <laughs> yeah. And he, he, since he stopped wearing it, his form's gone. So I think we need to get him back in the, the elbow sleeve and then his powers come back like Samson. So uh, let's see if we can get him back in that. But listen, all fun, fun and jokes aside, on his day, he is unplayable. On his day, he is magnificent. Um, I don't know what's happened and why it's happening. Obviously, we don't know what's going on in his personal life or if that, or what's going on behind closed doors. He is a magnificent player when he's on form. And let's just hope for the running, he finds that form. Because uh, an on-fire Basuma for the end of the season will be a huge plus for Tottenham with the games we got coming.
I agree. And obviously, you also cast your mind back to some of the bigger games earlier in the season, like against Arsenal and, and Liverpool, and he was absolutely brilliant in those games. So if we're going to get results in these big games, I do feel like we need a very good Basuma um, to turn up in those games. But for you, obviously... Um, he came off a half time against Forest and Hoybier came on and we ended up turning it around. Yep. Um, does that mean Basuma comes out of the team, do you reckon, for Newcastle on the weekend or do you persist with him? I, I got asked this on the fan show. Do you know what? I, I, I said with the midfield right now, the, the first nine, get, ten games of the season, we just said that midfield was purring. It looked like every single base was covered within that, that trilogy of Madison, Saar and Basuma. And for some reason recently, that combination, not just that we can't seem to find the right combination for the midfield, for the for the team we're playing against. Um, Basuma and Saar obviously came off. I saw in the comments a lot of people also mentioning it was Ramadan and they were fasting, so they came off, which you can understand, obviously. Um, it could be it was a bad performance. Um, Basuma, for me, you just don't know which one you're going to get. Hoybier, I think, was magnificent when he came on, as was Benson Cor. But I, I've said all season, I think Hoybier has a better impact when he comes on off the bench because he kind of knows what is needed. When it's nil-nil and starting the game off, I think Hoiber sometimes doesn't really do the job. So I'm, I'm more inclined to want to see Benton call in the start than Hoiber. But right now, we can't seem to get that combination right. So I'm just hoping mm -hmm. Ange picks the right combination because the midfield battle is going to be absolutely vital uh, away at that, uh, Newcastle on Saturday. Yeah, I completely agree. Um, but look, that is it for today's Tottenham update. Let me know in the comment section below all your thoughts on what we discussed today. Go check out more on Brian on Tottenham on tour as well, if you haven't already, um, and go give him a subscribe. Show him some love, because there's a lot of love to give for Brian Daigle on this channel. So oh, big up thank to Brian. You. Thanks for joining me today. Like, subscribe, and comment. And as always, come on, come you Spurs. On you Spurs.